I cannot think of a more appropriate person than Dr. Tanya Harrod to be the opening speaker for this conference. She's well known to the craft world generally, having been an authoritative and intelligent writer on craft for almost as long as I've been aware of that as a practice, a discipline practice. She was visiting professor at the RCA for 10 years, founding editor of the Journal of Modern Craft. She wrote a seminal text on Michael Cardew, which stands to this day as one of the best uh, monographs written about a ceramic artist. She lives in London, and she lives in a house that carries three generations of makers before her. The Harrods have lived there for a long time. And that house has accumulated the kind of history that we're always, all aware of when you live in a world of makers and a world of people who love making. Things, objects, stuff. She's also, writtenly, uh, she's also recently um, published a new book, um, which is available here. Um, you can buy at the uh, trade stand. Um, which stockist has got the book? I can't remember now. Walkers? Anyway, it's being stocked at one of the trade stands. The Real Thing, Essays on Making in the Modern World. She's a self-described modernist and was one of the founding editors of the Journal of Modern Craft, one of the first and major peer-reviewed um, publications for writing on modern craft. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Tanya. Thank you. I forgot to do the obits. Yeah. Great. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, a real honor. Um, this talk is actually a uh, dedicated um, sort of kind of thing for, to kind of it's hard to hear you. sorry I'm just um, sorting out my technology oh I can just do that no don't worry I'll, 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 I'll just um, right okay um, this talk is dedicated to the great Australian potter, uh, Gwyn Hanson Piggott, um, who tragically suffered a stroke in London in the summer of 2013, um, from which she did not recover. So she died far from home, but of course, like so many of you, she was very much a world citizen. Knowing her and knowing her work, which we see here, was a huge privilege and helped me think more clearly about ceramics, which is partly why it does seem such an honor to be here today. Gwyn loved to talk and she had a wonderful mind. Um, she's inspired me to plunge in, to plunge into that world of clay with its push and pull of change and continuity. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Not at the back, ah. Well, there's a speak, uh, maybe this should be turned up a little bit. Um, I'll start by plunging in by talking about the Norwegian potter, Jens Erland. Um, he named his recent exhibition at the Kunstindustrie Museum in Trondheim, Born Not Made. He borrowed the phrase, uh, as I expect you all know, from the Japanese philosopher Soetsu Yanagi. Yanagi used born not made to characterize minge, in turn a word, a neologism, that he, Hamada, and Kanjiro Kwai coined. And minge, of course, means literally art of the people. We might use the term folk art. Minge exemplified for Yanagi, things that were born, not made. Things made unselfconsciously outside the academy, outside high culture. So Jens Allen took the phrase to unexpected places. He juxtaposed 
objects like this, um, a bowl from the Kunstindustrie Museum in Trondheim, uh, a Joseon Dynasty Korean bowl, with discarded porcelain scraps that he appropriated, altered, glazed and fired while he was working at the Novs Technis Porcelanum. Um, this is a piece called Through of uh, 2014. And the Novstech Nisk Porcelain is a long-established Norwegian factory making state-of-the-art electrical insulators. So Erland's show brought together two kinds of so-called natural making. Firstly, historic pieces made by Korean potters, whose work Yanagi and other figures like Bernard Leach designated innocent and nonchalant, and secondly, the autogenic activities of an industrial pug mill and its discarded byproducts. Jens Erland's moving exhibition investigated ideas about unmediated innocence and spontaneity and celebrated Clay's responsiveness to hand and to machine. It's an approach familiar from the British potter Neil Brownsword's rather different use of byproducts salvaged from the ceramic factory scrap truck, a project that incidentally also mourns the demise of the ceramics industry in Britain. Um, these are some fused drip trays from his large uh, project salvage series, and this is uh, a group of objects that are part of this series. Meanwhile, the Canadian photographer Chris Carreri's remarkable photograph shown recently at the Gardner Museum in Toronto similarly set out to capture the accidental beauty of unfired discards from the potter's wheel. This quarrying of innocence, what might be called the born not made syndrome, has informed ceramics practice as, as an art form from the early 20th century onwards. Indeed, some 34 years ago, that's another reason why I'm so moved to be here, Michael Cardew grappled with the idea when he gave a keynote at this very triennale. I don't know whether it was a triennale in those days or whether it was a biennial, uh, bi <laughs> bi <laughs> yeah. um, which was held in 1981 in Sydney. In his talk, The Resourceful Potter, Michael Cardew asked, with his beloved West African pots in mind, why vernacular pots were so good. This is um, a beer pot from northern Nigeria, which was part of Michael's collection. It's illustrated in his wonderful book, Pioneer Pottery of 1969. Cardew concluded that it was because their makers, I quote, never had to go to school, just as birds would not be able to build such beautiful nests if they had to learn about engineering, nor lay such beautiful eggs if they had had to attend a school of design. Cardew eventually steps away from this somewhat deterministic argument rooted in modernist colonialist ideas about the glamour of backwardness. He decides that Nigerian pots were good because they were rooted in communities and were, at all kinds of different levels, functional. It was function, according to Michael Cardew, that caused these pots to appear born, not made. The everyday objects that Yanagi Soetsu admired and which he saw as minge, art of the people, were similarly functional. They were produced by Japanese and Korean uh, artisan craftsmen and women and designed for practical purposes without, he believed, any overt intention of achieving beauty. Objects like this wooden kettle hanger and this fireman's coat made of deer sting, deer skin, both uh, in the minge khan. Uh, as well as everyday stoneware and porcelain and lacquer, born, not made. Yanagi used his phrase, born, not made, to coax Bernard Leach into concentrating on slipware after Leach's return to England in 1920. This is an earthenware dish, the Tree of Life of 1923, in the Victorian Albert Museum. Yanagi felt, rightly or wrongly, that slipware came more naturally to Leach, more naturally than attempting stoneware inspired by Far Eastern ceramics. It may seem strange that this matter of innocence and naturalness and how it might accrue to ceramics 
what Herbert Reed condescendingly called a stumbling into beauty when describing Staffordshire flatbacks, is still very much a live issue. Its continuing relevance may be a reaction to the pervasive nature of new technology and the screen-based information that dominates our lives. Yanagi's phrase of approbation, born not made, has, however, the capacity to both open up and close down the experiential world, to free the spirit, or, as we shall see, endorse humans working in an unselfconscious state because they are working repetitively. This can mean that they are working, in effect, like machines. The phrase born not made can even be seen as endorsing the elimination of human involvement, the dream of objects that make themselves. We might begin by looking outside ceramics at the thinking of the aesthetician John Ruskin on this matter of materials. In 1858, Ruskin spoke on the work of iron in nature, art and policy. He began with a personal vision of the chemistry of iron, which he described as taking its oxygen from the air as eagerly as we do, and of its virtuous role, for without iron oxides, the earth would be the color of ashes. Iron, Ruskin observed, was also responsible for coloring our blood so that we cannot even blush without its help. Through the process of rusting, iron makes the ochreous dust that gives warmth to bricks and tiles. Ruskin wanted worked iron's qualities to be honored and respected as strength and ductility. Tenacious iron, he said, was best shaped at speed under a hammer into decorative scrolls and leaves. This is actually a, a 17th century North Italian wrought iron screen from the Victorian Albert Museum, the kind of thing he must have been thinking of. The central part of his talk contrasted worked or wrought iron like this with cheaper cast iron. This is a snap I took of some 19th century railings in Exhibition Road in London. Cast iron railings, Ruskin thought, were brittle imitations of wrought iron. And unlike stone and brick walls, he wrote, shelter nothing and support nothing. They were, he said, emblematic of a sophisticated, unkind, uncomfortable, unprincipled society. Cast iron was the opposite of born, not made. This intertwining of ethical and emotional responses to materials has a long history. The idea that mankind's bold transformation and commoditization of the physical world has negative moral implications had traction in the ancient world. Pliny the Elder devoted two books of his natural history to metals and one book to stone where he laments the prodigality of our inventiveness in how many ways have we raised the price of objects. Man has learned to compete with nature. In the 16th century, Michelangelo and Vasari developed the idea that the sculptor in particular needed to respect his raw material. In a sonnet, Michelangelo took the idea further, modestly defining sculpture as a process of subtracting what was superfluous to reveal what already existed. To break the marble spell is all the hand that serves the brain can do. Michelangelo's unfinished St. Matthew in the Academia in Florence that we see here shows how Michelangelo's method of carving, gradually exposing the figure as if left lifting it out of a bath of water makes this poetic idea manifest. Ruskin's poetic idiosyncratic attitude to materials led him to identify the individual characters of iron, glass, marble, precious stones, wood and stucco. For instance, he had um, a deep, deep dislike of cut glass. Uh, this is a, a French vase on a plinth with ormolu mounts of about 1825, just the sort of thing he absolutely hated. Um, he thought it unnatural and machine-like. This is what he liked, um, these blown glasses designed by the great arts and crafts figure Philip Webb. Ruskin's approach was replicated in many 19th century debates about material authenticity. New materials came in for a special scrutiny. 
We tend to think of the plastics family as the first group of new materials to excite popular anxiety. But in the 19th century, papier-mâché and rubber anticipated the plastics family in their quality of malleability and their capacity to stand in for other materials. This ballooning papier-mâché chair was illustrated in an article on the subject in the Illustrated Magazine of Art of 1854. As Glenn Adamson has pointed out in his remarkable book, The Invention of Craft, these were materials that were poured and molded, and like cast iron, effaced the role of the craftsman or craftswoman while imitating craft effects. As the designer and design theorist Godfried Semper noted in 1852, rubber and gutta percha are vulcanized and utilized in a thousand imitations of wood, metal, and stone carvings, exceeding by far the natural limitations of the materials they purport to represent. This is a page making manifest Ruskin's anxieties, showing the varied practical and decorative uses of gutta percha from the gutta percha leaflet produced for the Great Exhibition of 1851. For Godfrey Semper, it was only the uncivilized nations, as he put it, that were able to make good work because they designed with the logic and resistance of natural materials in mind. Semper wrote sorrowfully, we are masters of enormous means and it is this abundance of means which is our greatest danger. Only by reasoning are we able to get some kind of order into this matter, since we have lost our feeling for it. By the 20th century, such design reform views have become natrified and simplified under the rubric truth to materials, a term implicit in Herbert Reed's discussion of form and making in his Art, of, Art and Industry of 1934. Here we see tweeds woven by schoolgirls under the direction of the weaver Ella McLeod that Reed held up as respecting the raw material. And here, a medieval jug, again illustrating the natural qualities of pottery form, both illustrations in Reed's art and industry. Truth to materials was central to the ambivalent, often hostile, 20th century response to a variety of new materials, such as plywood and rather later petroleum-based polymers. In the early 20th century, part of being modern was to be anti-modern. There was, as the social historian Jose Harris observes, a lurking grief at the memory of a lost domain, a sense that change was inevitable, in many respects desirable, but that its gains were being purchased at a terrible price. Jose Harris is writing about Britain, but the sense of loss was Europe-wide, worldwide. The German poet Rainer Maria Rilke observed poignantly in 1925, even for our grandparents, a house, a well, a familiar tower, their very dress, their cloak, was infinitely more intimate, almost everything a receptacle in which they both found and enlarged a store of humanness. The animated experience things that share our lives are running out and cannot be replaced. We are perhaps the last to have known such things. What did he mean? Was he referring to objects born, not made, in the sense of things made in a continuum that was in some sense natural? I think that we are talking to an extent about naturalness, or maybe the naturalness fallacy, the idea that naturalness is intrinsically good. This naturalness, as we have seen, was identified by Gottfried Semper as surviving among so-called uncivilized nations, amongst people who supposedly worked unselfconsciously or innocently as nature works, to quote another Victorian design reformer, Richard Redgrave. This innocence was often ascribed to non-European production, but also to the surviving folk art of Europe. Here we see Croatian women knitting and spinning on the move from William Frederick Bailey's book, Slavs of the War Zone of 1916, a sight that startled and moved the British weaver Ethel Marry in 1930 on her travels in what was then the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. An emphasis on naturalness and unselfconsciousness fitted with modernism's rejection of formal academic art and of systemized art education. 
Just to provide another example, the search for unselfconsciousness drew the Blauer Writer, the group founded by Vasily Kandinsky and Franz Marc, to Bavarian glass painting. Many examples of this folk or people's art were illustrated in the Blauer Writer Almanac. Here we see Death of a Saint, which is now in fact in the Obergamma Museum, um, but which, was, which was illustrated in the Almanac. Staying at Murmau on the Staffelsee in Bavaria, in Bavaria, the Blauer Writer group became interested in this art form, hinter Glasmalerei, literally painting behind the glass, a cottage industry in the town, and the epitome of unselfconscious art production, with images made over and over again, repetitively for sale at country fairs. It could be argued that the studio ceramics movement of the interwar years of the 1920s and 30s sought to recuperate naturalness by turning to a craft that had existed largely outside the academy, the making, firing and decorating of pots. I'm excluding all kinds of high style ceramics here, Serve Meissen for instance. Leading British studio potters who began their career in the first decades of the last century subscribe to Yanagi's idea of born not made either consciously or unconsciously. Here is William State Murray's magnificent pot Persian Garden of 1931 which is in York City Art Gallery. And in a letter of 1955 reflecting back he thought about the semi-meditative act of throwing. When there is not self but only consciousness in the unconscious, in emptiness where the unhindered creative principle manifests itself. A pot is born, not made. Then we have Michael Cardew writing in 1971 of making pots as naturally as a tree makes leaves or fruits in his talk, The Fatal Impact. This is a large slipware jar decorated with leaves and fish and flowers, suitably enough in the collection of David Attenborough. The true artist, Cardew wrote, obtains his stuff from the same sources as a child or an aboriginal tribesman. We'd find these kind of remarks impossible to deal with now. But similarly, and slightly differently, Catherine Pladel Bouvery wrote to Bernard Leach in 1930, I want my pots to make people think not of the Chinese, but of things like pebbles and shells and bird's eggs and the stones over which moss grows. Don't run away with the idea that I want to imitate stones and pebbles or make flowers out of fish bones, but I do want the reaction of someone who sees flowers in my pots to be, that looks natural. This is her rock's egg, a stoneware pot of 1929 in the Victorian Albert Museum. But this valorization of unselfconsciousness was not in itself progressive or even humane. The dark side of born not the born not made thesis was the desire to hold people back, to preserve naturalness, to cast doubts on progress and modernity. This can be both a modernist position but also an imperial or colonial thesis. Both modernists and artistically minded colonialists identified all kinds of groups, the Bush people of the Kalahari, folk artists, oppressed Koreans, Serbian potters and weavers, and even children, as possessing that naturalness which no trained European can now hope to attain, as the artist and mu museum curator Kenneth Murray put it, writing about the arts of West Africa in 1933. Yanagi Suetsu, speaking in 1952 at the famous Dartington Conference, speculated as to why the painting on Sisu wares, the non-imperial ware produced in northern China from the 10th century and on up to the early 20th century, uh, was so superb. This is a disturbing passage that I often quote. He explained that the wares were decorated by boys aged around 10. I quote, many of whom no doubt disliked the work and had to be forced by their parents to do it. Occasionally as, their work, as they worked, their eyes would be blinded by tears. Yet the results were fine, even though they were not by trained artists. Rather the reverse, lack of individuality and the fact that these young boys had to repeat designs over and over again explained the beauty of the result. The boys forgot themselves as they worked. 
wrote Yanagi, or perhaps it would be more correct to say they worked in a world so free that they were able to forget themselves. Were the boys working like sentient beings or like machines? It is a short step from things that are born not made to things that appear to make themselves, prized because they lack affectation, but make, making the maker redundant as much as he or she seemed to be in the context of the moldable materials like cast iron or gutta percha that so disturbed Ruskin and Semper. Things that make themselves might include the so-called Chinese scholars' rocks, they look like natural objects framed by the evident artifice of the basis on which they rest. But their very recognition as objects for contemplation is based on an arbiter, an aesthetician who decides these objects are worthy of attention, and furthermore, on a hidden craftsman who subtly alters and improves such rocks before they are sold on to the elite. They are loosely comparable to the fa famous Kaisermon Tebow, a humble Korean rice bowl that was discovered, so to speak, at the beginning of the 17th century and brought into the sphere of the tea masters. It is a bowl that Yanagi tells us was born, not made, by Korean workmen who lacked intellectual consciousness. Like the Chinese scholars' rocks, the Kizmon tea bowl was made for our approbation by the connoisseur who singled it out. But the idea of born not made in the case of objects is also paradoxically embedded in the history and ambitions of multiple production. Our 19th century artist and design reformer Richard Redgrave wrote in the mid-19th century on the traditional Indian craftsman who he said works as nature works. Redgrave thought this was not possible with the stamp, the mold, the press and the dye with automated production. But autogenic making, leaving out a hand and mind working in unison as nature works, was the utopian endgame of the mass production that Redgrave so disliked. It was a different sort of born not made, a different sort of natural making, excluding the hand of the artisan. The goal is set out in Andrew Year's The Philosophy of Manufactures of 1835, from which this is an illustration. Year wrote lyrically of spinning mules that replace spinners. It was, he wrote, delightful to see 800 to 1,000 spindles of polished steel advancing and receding in a mathematical line. In the same book, Andrew Year illustrated Thomas Robinson's power loom factory at Stockport, where countless self-acting looms work busily, tended by just a few young women no troublesome male workers, to challenge the scaled-up image of the owner standing in the aisle that you see here. Of course, Andrew Year's dream of objects that make themselves has not gone away. I expect some of you have seen the 2011 TED Talk given by Skylar, Skylar Tibbetts of MIT's Self-Assembly Lab. He spoke on self-assembling structures Tibbetts compares present-day manufacturing of, say, skyscrapers, which take two and a half years to build and can be made up of 50,000 to a million parts of materials like steel and concrete, to natural systems like DNA, which is made up of three million base pairs that can replicate in an hour. He argues that the behavior of the materials of natural systems could be translated to the building environment, creating materials such as bricks or metal that once programmed can learn to build, replicate, and repair themselves. He introduces us to the idea of programmable matter, the science, engineering, and design of physical matter that has the ability to change and or function in a programmable fashion. It's early days, this is an image from his talk, a self-folding strand making itself into a 3D cube. In one respect, Tibbetts' goal of self-assembly is not so very different in aim from the early industrialists and commentators like Andrew Ure. By having things make themselves, we do away with people. Thus, in the kind of macro construction dreamt of by Skylar Tibbetts, Builders, bricklayers, blacksmiths, plasterers, painters, and electricians might become obsolete in the face of self-assembly. Born, not made, indeed. One area familiar to all of us involves the imaginative use of scanners and 3D printers to make manifest objects we cannot make or only make with supreme difficulty. 
the artist Annie Cattrall has replicated invisible things, like, for example, the artist's own beating heart. This is her piece, Centered, of 2006, which was made in collaboration with scientists using magnetic resonance imaging scans. The artist submitted herself to an MIR scan to build up a full 3D image of her heart, which we see here converted into a 3D file and printed out. In another work Cat by Cattrall, Conditions of 2006, the form of clouds are laser captured and then laser etched into blocks of glass. These are examples of autogenic craft work, highly crafted but not made by hand. Then we have Geoffrey Mann's well-known shine, made by documenting a candelabra and its shiny reflectiveness using a scanner. When scanning a metallic object, the scanner is unable to distinguish between surface and reflection. The spikes on the rapid prototype copy represent the reflective light bouncing off the silver candelabra. Here the same copy cast from a mold in silver, shines a beguiling object that reveals how the robotic scanner observes. Here's Geoffrey Mann's capturing of a bird's flight cast into glass, and his image of the fluttering of a moth, laser etched like Cattrall's piece conditions into glass. Both Mann and Cattrall, at their most imaginative, recall objects that come into being by their own devices or with minimal interference, like Chinese philosophers' rocks, natural but often subtly modified with tools. To see a rock as a mountain is a leap of imagination. To see the unseeable, the human beating heart, or to hold a cloud in your hand, to track accurately a fluttering moth, these are remarkable visual experiences comparable to the photographer Edward Mybridge's researches into movement. The rapid prototyping machine can, of course, also make itself. At an amateur level, there is the availability and affordability of Adrian Bauer's RepRap self-replicating rapid prototyping machine. In theory, we could all have one or its equivalent in our living room, printing out spare parts and tools like these pliers from designs downloaded from the internet, spewing out objects that fit the born not made bill and could also be described as grown, not man-made, as it were, naturally. There is a wired constituency who would like us all to turn into little homesteaders, no longer enthralled to the dark satanic mills of anywhere. Every home a manufacturer, ma manufactory making its own pliers. Autogenic making. Slightly akin to magic, these things are now being made in a disembodied way, like these vases being printed in porcelain <coughs> on the cover of my book um, by the Antwerp firm Upfold. They are becoming normalized, very much part of the world of craft. Loosely linked to autogenic making is the current interest that ceramicists in particular take in the factory as a site of production. Studio pottery initially grew out of a dissatisfaction with the cold perfection of factory-made ceramics, seen at its coldest and most perfect in the form of affordable earthenwares made by the Wedgwood factory from the 18th century onwards. Now, however, British factories have mostly closed or relocated because of rising labor costs. This has served to expose the strange symbiotic relationship between studio ceramics and factory ceramics. Like a painting and a frame, they needed each other. In fact, arguably, early studio ceramics needed the dead perfection of the factory to work against, more than the factory needed studio ceramics. Which might explain why, paradoxically, so many studio potters are currently being drawn to ceramic factories and want to work in those environments. The ceramics factory was the studio's other both put clay at the heart of creativity. In the United Kingdom, as a visit to Stoke-on-Trent makes plain, factories are disappearing. This is a demolished factory photographed by Neil Brownsword. To find factories, we need to head east. Of course, there's nothing new about studio ceramicists traveling to the Far East, above all to China. If you love ceramics, a visit must be made, if only in your imagination. It is just that the motives for going have changed. For example, organized visits to China by distinguished British, British studio potters took place in 1978 and 1981. 
Their accounts of what they saw, which appeared in the British publication Ceramic Review, are of interest. They were impressed by the skills they, visit, they, wit, they witnessed, but they were also dismayed. For most of them, the high point was seeing the ceramics of the past in Chinese museums. The present appeared disappointing. These friendly, hard-working, ingenious, self-sufficient people have little originality, reflected the potter Frank Hammer in 1981 in Jinga Zhen. These are photographs taken by British potters on that 1981 visit to the city, showing throwing, turning, and decorating porcelain. The British studio potters had to fight to see dragon kilns and simple vernacular stoneware. Their hosts wanted to show them the latest ceramic technology. Had not Chairman Mao decreed that all handwork must be swept away? The idea of going to work in a factory, even if many, as we can see here, were little more than large workshops with plenty of throwing and hands-on activity, would have seemed aesthetically inconceivable to these studio potters over 30 years ago. As the potter Dellen Cookson wrote of the factories they visited, much of what the Chinese produce is garish and insensitive. Now there are streams of ceramicists going specifically to Chinese factories and for whom the bright and shiny ware holds no fears. The high skill and frenzied activities in such places appears full of romance, especially as our own Stoke-on-Trent falls into ruinous decay, another striking image <coughs> taken by the potter Neil Brownsword. Indeed, some ceramicists, like Robin Best, have relocated to Jingaden, using the factory to make blanks that carry her own hand-painted, highly politicized commentaries on trade routes past and present, east and west and Antipodean. We now live in the world of what Janet Deboos has aptly called the distributed studio. For instance, Felicity Aliff's well-known porcelain jars are made at Mr. Wu's bigware factory at Jinga Zhen. Aliff decorates her pots using a range of techniques, from intricate patterns employing the Famille Rose palette to bold painterly iron and cobalt brush strokes, like this great pot here, which we see pictured alongside the big ware factory's usual output. Aliff's imaginative interest in historicist quotation is less startling than the scale of these objects, each standing over three meters high, thrown in sections by the big ware factory artisans. These pieces, to my mind, have the quality of souvenirs, not necessarily in a reductive sense. Their present brings to mind the scholar Susan Stewart's characterization of the souvenir as an object that always displays the romance of contraband, for its scandal is its removal from its natural location. If studio pottery at the beginning of the last century was defined against the factory, today factories are places full of marvels, more exciting and challenging than the studio, places where it is natural to make things in clay, in terms of the United Kingdom, an antidote to the service industry nation that we have become. If the ceramic factory and its diminution and destruction in Northern Europe is responsible for what might be called industrial nostalgia, there is an equally marked movement, an apparently global movement young, among young artists who do not describe themselves as potters or ceramicists, but who are drawn to clay. They too are embracing another kind of born not made that is predicated on another kind of ceramic innocence, an innocence that seeks to distance itself from the world of studio ceramics. The young British artist Aaron Angel, whose ceramic work deliberately quotes primary school hand building, this is his Swan Pedalo One, I remember John Barleycorn of 2013, likes the barely useful ceramic types that are endemic to schools and prisons, desk tidies being a good example. His Troy Town Art Pottery in the East End of London is intended, I quote, as a radical and psychedelic resource for artists who want to work in clay. It is specifically a place to experiment away from people who know about ceramic technology. The curator of last year's ceramic show, Fire, at the New York a gallery, Venus over Manhattan, noted that ceramics art 
is having ceramics art is having an extraordinary renaissance. It's coming back into fashion as a reaction to the internet age. It provides a need among certain artists to go back to basics. Fire included potters and so-called fine artists, but it was the latter group that offered attack energy in the embrace of failure. Here, Ruby Sterling's Basin Theology, Talwin and Ritalin, and here, Josh Smith's Untitled, a tribute of a sort to studio ceramics. In fact, many of these artists are not entirely ignorant of the ceramic world. They appear to be inspired by origins, by the faltering first efforts of the studio ceramics movement, but not by its development and popularization and normalization. In addition, the achievements of Lucio Fontana are unconditionally admired, along with other Italian ceramic artists like Leonardo Leoncillo, this is his St. Sebastian Bianco of 1962 in the Hockemeyer collection. Peter Vulkus and his pupils are of interest. Here's Peter Vulkus's Solana of 1959 in Oakland Museum, California. 1970s hand building is studied in old copies of Ceramic Review. Here we see Gillian Lowndes and her husband Ian Old pictured in 1977. Folk ceramics are studied and emulated. Here's a head by the British artist Jess Wine, Chester Man too, as are outsider art and child art, all areas that modernists firmly believe to be the source of naturalness of born, not made. As Aaron Angel explains, while almost all of the necessary technical knowledge for the production of ceramic sculpture comes from the world of studio pottery, it is our belief that ceramics is better suited as a free material, completely divorced from its status as a material for the production of practical objects. It's a kind of misreading of what studio pottery is all about. A creative misleading, perhaps. In Britain, the rhetoric of these artists frequently suggests they have rediscovered a lost art form. Irritating though these claims may seem, they suggest a need to stake out new territory. They have some credence because so many ceramic courses have closed in the United Kingdom. Much is made of clay's cheapness, immediacy and remoteness from our quotidian flat screen world. The similarities with the early studio potters of the 20th century are striking. They too were self-taught with an aversion to too much knowledge. Witness Bernard Leach, Michael Cardew and Catherine Pladel Wouvery's contempt for the work of the technically skilled Charles Vyse. We're now confronted with a whole new generation who have fallen in love with clay, who are poring over the how to do it sections of Leach's A Potter's Book, beginning again rewriting history, taking a path that mixes deliberate ignorance with selective looking, enjoying the companionship of the workshop, mostly making plinth-sized, tabletop-sized pieces, stepping up to the plate in their own way. I'd like to end with some reflections on rather more political ways in which we might engage with clay naturally. Clay is not like oil or coal, something we're fighting over, but clay can be employed to investigate and interrogate our treatment of the earth on which we live. It can take us, as Michael Cardew found, to remote places, which leads me to a recent project by the remarkable nomadic design studio Unknown Fields Division, led by Liam Young and Kate Davis, based at London's Architectural Association. Unknown fields mounts expeditions that bear witness to the consequences of technical and economic development that record the human and environmental cost behind <coughs> the production of mobile phones, all kinds of white goods, behind standalone luxuries like gold and sapphires, Christmas decorations and even our so-called green technologies. Unknown fields have investigated gold mining in Australia and sapphire mining in Madagascar. In a recent unknown fields project, Rare Earthenware, carried out in collaboration with the Victoria and Albert Museum show What is Luxury, the unknown fields team tracked rare earths widely used in high-end electronics and in green technologies to a key producer in China. At Batu City, you see there in the distance, 
and the artificially, artificially formed Batu Lake that you see uh, to the right <coughs> in Inner Mongolia, they recorded the environmental cost of our, envir of our everyday technologies. Here we see uh, Liam Young collecting clay for the project near the outflow of the Biogang Steel and Rare Earth Complex at Batu Lake. Rare earths are, in fact, not that rare, but they require toxic and hazardous processes of extraction, hence the desolation we see here. Thrown by the potter Kevin Callahan, wearing rubber gloves and a face mask, three vessels were made using this heavily polluted clay, each taking the form of a historic Chinese vase. Each vase was sized in relation to the amount of waste created in the production of three everyday items of technology. From left to right, a smartphone, a featherweight, a <coughs> laptop, and the cell of a smart car battery. The rare earthenware project led me to reflect on books like Michael Cardew's 1969 Pioneer Pottery and Ivan McMeekin's 1978 Notes for Potters in Australia, Raw Materials and Clay Bodies. These are extraordinary texts, which surely can be used in many ways. They teach us suitable respect and wonder for our environment. They can take us literally into unknown territory, unknown fields. They are Bibles of production. In pioneer pottery, building a kiln starts by making your own bricks, as opposed to consumption. As Michael Cardew put it poetically, geology is more than science, it more than just a science. It has intellectual and moral uses. And I think <clears throat> that is true of ceramic production also. So here's to ceramics with intellectual and moral uses. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, we, Tanya, we're having a question and answer session. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't, you didn't get off quite so easily. Um, that was um, a marvellously stimulating talk, and canvassed so many issues um, that I'm sure many of you have questions that you would like to propose to. Um, Tanya in the meantime. Just before I forget, it's the uh, Taka stall that has copies of her book for sale. Um, so that will give you an opportunity to see it in the flesh, so to speak. Um, I, I found it fascinating with um, Tanya's talk, the way in which um, ceramics seems to be um, a very tricky material. It seems to be able to change its form. It's something of a chameleon. Um, and it can be both reviled and adored, and neither of those absolute positions seem to suit it very well, because it changes yet again. Um, I would like to um, ask you, are there any questions at the moment that people have ready to go? There are two microphones available. Very nice observations there. Would you like to have this? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's better. Huh. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get you water. I forgot to put the water. Oh, don't worry. I'm good. Mm. Yes. Hello. It's all well done. Um, you mentioned someone who wrote about movement. I didn't catch the name. Sorry. You wrote about. Uh, you just mentioned someone who uh, talked about movement. They they were interested in. I think it was when you were talking about the moth flight. Oh right. To glass. I didn't yes. Name. Yes. He's called Jeffrey Mann. Um, he's kind of relatively young, and he's he's perhaps the first wave of um, uh, men and women coming out of um, 
uh, well, departments of ceramics, glass, metalwork, uh, places where you might not expect the new technology to take a hold, but, you know, we're absolutely captivated by it. Because um, I guess if you make um, all these aspects of the new technology have a fascination, uh, inevitably. Um, but the question is how, how we go beyond um, uh, how we do something profound with the technology, I guess. Um, you know, it's rather like the very early days of cinema when people were just excited to see people moving or jumping up and down. <laughs> you know, um, people call that the cinema of attractions. Um, so you could talk about the technology of attractions, I guess. Hello, my name is Daniel. Thank you for your talk. I'd like you to speak about um, the reaction to uh, British um, new ceramic people coming on board, given the lack of institutional uh, support now. How, how does that work? How yeah. Ceramic people come on board? Well, I mean, it's really, really difficult. Um, and um, I spoke about these young artists who kind of turned to ceramics. I mean, it's, you'd be hard put now to find a young self-respecting young artist who isn't doing something uh, with clay but equally um, people who make ceramics central to their create creativity are taking things into their own hands and setting up uh, teaching workshops um, uh, because right now in London uh, apart from the city lit which is a very famous sort of evening class um, uh, way of um, um, doing a ceramics course. There's only one art school teaching, teaching, teaching ceramics. It's, it, it's sort of tragic uh, and extraordinary. Because, uh, you know, this is just a moment when making and the idea of craft, books like um, Richard Sennett's The Craftsman, that people are really uh, <laughs> deeply attracted to that sort of thing. In fact, I was talking to the potter Richard Batram, who leads a fairly sort of isolated life down in Dorset, and he's finding that young people are sort of making pilgrimages to see him. That, that kind of way of life now seems so remote and extraordinary. So are you saying uh, mentorship is happening? Or, uh, Sorry? Is mentorship happening instead of uh, I think it, like a, a yes. institution? Yes. I mean, figures like Edward Duval and uh, Julian Stair, who take on... Uh, apprentice, apprentices to work in, the, if they, you know, in their very large studios. So that's a full circle from... Uh, well, it's sort years. of like going back to the beginning again. It's, it's so extraordinary. Um, although, I suppose on one level, you could, you could see it as a thrilling challenge. <laughs> um, because, you know, because all the factories are closing, in a way, the great body of knowledge about ceramics resided in the studio pottery movement and then the people running art schools thought we'll just close all this down um, it's expensive you know the ideal kind of uh, student is probably a graphic artist who can just be sent home with a laptop um, sort of. um, thank you very much um, for your fantastically up to the minute um, you know discussion of ceramics and clay and its various directions. My name's Tony Warburton. And um, there's a question that I think kind of lurks behind all discussions of ceramic. And I, I, I'd like to differentiate, I guess, between clay and ceramic because it's when we subject clay to the sort of geological and technological process of firing that it's transformed and and become ceramic and I think the history of fuels that have been used for kilns to fire this firing process um, it's a very um, interesting discussion in Australia where there are so many people who are able to do wood firing and lots of analysis about wood as being a renewable fuel and so forth and then questions about people firing with electricity 
um, in Australia, whether you use gas because of the fracking implications. So some of the moral and ethical issues and expense issues that you raised when you were referring to cardiogeology and just recently the closing <laughs> down of so many ceramic educational opportunities. We're all equally puzzled by why so many have closed down here in Australia when we don't have industry. And I have to wonder whether a bureaucrat has looked at the costs of fuel and firing and decided rather than to suggest strategies of how that could be better managed, has just put a big kind of shutdown red cross <laughs> over everything. And I was wondering if in all your research you've encountered much discussion about the sort of ethics and process and you know mm. implications of fuel and firing. Yes, I mean I think the closing down of uh, material-based courses um, I mean, it's not just the firing, it's everything about those sorts of courses, and that not just ceramics. It's sort of expensive. Um, um, but um, I suppose I have sort of thought about firing. I've thought about it a lot in the context of Michael Cardew in West Africa, where he was um, wood firing to stoneware temperatures, using huge amounts of wood in an environment where wood was scarce, and where the local potters actually um, uh, did these highly efficient firings, um, which were very, very brief and which just used offcuts of uh, agricultural processes. And, you know, it was absolutely perfectly judged uh, for the environment. Um, I mean, the ceramics industry sprang up like so many industrial activities in Britain. Uh, because we had access to coal, you know. And so, obviously, any form of making now, you know, one, one, one sort of reflects on, on, um, on, on those kinds of environmental issues. Um, and um, I, I imagine there's a lot of debate amongst wood firers um, in, in Australia and, and, and in um, North America where, you know, wood firing has has a much much more traction than it than it does uh, in Britain, but I have no sort of neat answer to your question. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I feel studio pottery has never had a huge impact on the environment. And, of course, the ceramics industry with tunnel kilns and got more and more efficient um, uh, firing-wise. I, I don't know what, what the situation is like in, in China. Um, it must, must be very, very varied, sort of high-tech, low-tech, existing side-by-side. -side. Um, I've only been to Foshan, so I, I'm not terribly knowledgeable, unlike many of you. Um, one more question. Um, in the, uh... Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. Um, my name's Graham. Um, there's a, an issue that perplexes me, is there's this um, massive struggle for uh, identity in the ceramic world, in the contemporary ceramic world, which I find interesting in this current uh, time, um, whereas you speak of um, before the times when Yanagi was collecting works, there was this uh, born not made thing, that was, this, that was a time before this struggle. <laughs> uh, have you ever addressed that? Now that's definitely influencing um, what we make. Yeah, I mean, I think for ceramics, but also other art forms. Absolutely. Uh, uh, folk, a sort of minge or a folk art, a kind of art that was made outside the academy that seemed to be made naturally, uh, that, that sort of grew out of certain functions, be they religious or everyday. I mean, these, these kinds of objects have had a, a hold on us. Um, I suppose ever since, I don't know, the end of the 18th century, the, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think when they began to seem so valuable. 
Um, well, we speak with great reverence for those pieces that were sitting in, in, in the museums of the world. Yes. Uh, and we as contemporaries are also trying to um, uh, create and attract that same sort of um, uh, uh, aura. Yes. Uh, but yes. Is it, is it a, a, I don't. I don't. Do a, a finding your identity in this world as a little me, or <laughs> um, is it a market-based driven um, uh, phenomenon, or what? That's what I'm perplexed about. I think it's quite an um, uh, um, interesting uh, approach to contemporary practice. It's a. It's a really elusive quest, you know, to try and um, kind of replicate those so-called anonymous makers, I, I think. I mean, someone like um, Richard Batram, to me, comes sort of, sort of close to it. Um, he doesn't sign his work. He, he works in a sort of loosely Korean tradition. But of course, it's not that at all. It's very much his own work. And, uh, um, you know, part of me thinks, well, you know, I like the total artifice of, uh, of um, mice and figurines, you know, that, that aren't even thinking along those lines, that, uh, that we can never, um, it's not exactly compete with, or, but uh, we can never make unself-consciously. We just can't. Um, well, I mean, that's the way we're looking at it, you know, and of course we're, that's, that's the sort of alarming thing about our, you know, probably even now if you went into a, a village in northern Nigeria and spoke to, well, in fact, I did go and speak to a woman potter and I don't think she felt, I think she knew that she was, A, the best potter in the village and that she was making um, really interesting stuff, but... Um, you know, for us, it suits us to see her as part of a kind of <clears throat> living tradition that has no kind of ego attached to it. Um, so, hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Thank you very much, Tanya. There'll be opportunity over the next few days for people to um, talk further and ask questions uh, that arose from this morning. But to talk...